here tonight uh, to hear uh, from Eric Metaxas. Eric Metaxas uh, graduated from Yale University and uh, grew up in, in uh, Queens, New York, and he was raised in the Greek, Greek German community, which is really a Greek community. Uh, Greek culture overrides all other cultures, as he'd be the first to admit. And uh, Eric has a very powerful uh, story of conversion and how God intervened dramatically in his life. Uh, God's call in his life has unfolded and uh, God has allowed him to speak in a number of very prominent places in our country. He gave the address at the National Day of Prayer in 2012. Uh, he hosts a, a monthly program in New York City called Socrates in the City, which just uh, had an Oxford uh, edition and where Eric is trying to stimulate conversation uh, about the deeper questions, the meaning of life. And we live in a, in a cultural moment when many Americans are fearful of the deep questions. And Eric's call in life from the Lord is to, to cause us to think about the deeper questions and to facilitate that, which he does through, also through a daily radio program called Metaxas Talk. Uh, dot com, where he hosts speakers really of all varieties, and uh, it's a very eclectic show, and yet very stimulating, and provides a resource and avenues to start further conversations. Uh, God's also given Eric a gift with uh, writing, and he has written a number of very successful books. He wrote a biography of William Wilberforce uh, called Amazing Grace. He wrote the New York Times best-selling book on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and his recent book on uh, miracles has, has also become a New York Times bestseller. Uh, he has a book forthcoming later this spring, which he might mention. Uh, he was interviewed for the Wall Street Journal on his book, Miracles, and this article for the Wall Street Journal became the has become the most read article in the history of the Wall Street Journal and has over 600,000 likes on Facebook, which is, I think by anyone's count, difficult to obtain, no matter how many friends you have. Um, <laughs> But God has given him a, a, an important voice in the public square. Uh, but the real reason that we're here tonight, underneath all of that, any one of us, is the, the very real work of Jesus Christ in the world. And Hebrews 13.8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And part of the change in Eric's life has been learning about the German pastor, martyr, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and how Jesus Christ changed his life. Uh, Jesus Christ has changed my life. I wouldn't be here. I knew nothing of Christ until I was 16 years old. And Jesus Christ has changed Eric's life. And that's the real reason why we're here. And uh, my prayer is that we would all be blessed tonight. And uh, would you join me then in welcoming uh, Eric Metaxas. Wow. Wow. Please, please, take your seats, please, thank you. Uh, I know there are people watching in the overflow room, and if you're watching in the overflow room, typically, and I know this, you think, why are we in the overflow room? And I just want to tell you, the Lord works stuff out. You can't know this because you're in the overflow room, but there is, for whatever reason, a powerful, horrible stench in this, in this room Everyone here wishes they were where you are. So just these folks are going to, some of them are tearing up and stuff. Folks, we're going to get through this together. But I just want you to let you know that you've chosen the better portion. Uh, that's biblical. Um, my name is Eric Metaxas. I am truly am overwhelmed at this welcome. This is... Uh, Spectacular. I want to thank uh, Reverend David Palmer for being a, just a consummate host. I don't think I have ever gotten a tour of any city uh, like I got today. I, I trust most of it was factual because you have such an honest uh, presentation. But it really was a joy and uh, to get to speak at the University of Cincinnati. Th there's no way I can communicate truly how, what an encouragement it is to me and how much it means to me that people would want to come and hear me. There's a part of me that just sort of 
doesn't, uh, blocks it out, otherwise it would go to my head. I'm not kidding, like it's unfathomable to me and such a blessing to me that uh, people would wanna hear uh, anything that I would have to say. Uh, so I'm, I'm really grateful for you coming out. Thank you for, for being here. Um, I wanna touch on a few things and so I'll gallop along in New York fashion. Uh, I'm gonna talk quickly. You're gonna have to hear equally quickly Otherwise, you're going to miss stuff. So, uh, but um, <laughs> I, um, I woke up this morning in New York City. Uh, I would have come last night, but uh, because, uh, as uh, Pastor David said, I, um, my dad is Greek, uh, my mom's German, and so that makes me Greek, right? Uh, yeah, it's just it's like rock, paper, scissors, Greek crushes all other ethnicities. And so, so last night, I was invited to the New York City premiere of my big fat Greek wedding too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, iffy plot line, I'm not gonna give it away. Um, but you know, you realize I had to be there legally, I had to be there. So I just want you to know that uh, Greeks are just, we're, obliged, we're, we're legally obliged to be born in Astoria, Queens, New York. I don't know if you realize that either, but that's just a law. I don't know, I can't do anything about it. So I was born in Queens, New York. And like all, uh, you know, children of uh, parents who are German and Greek, I was raised Greek. That's just the way it was. And we went to the Greek Orthodox Church. And I always start there because it, it was an incredibly warm community. It was a wonderful community. But like so many, particularly ethnic communities around the country, it was more about that ethnicity and that experience than it was about the, the gospel or, or anything. In other words, I was an altar boy, I was in church every Sunday, uh, you know, good kid, not a troublemaker, but by the time I got to college, I, I really realized I had no clue uh, really about the Christian faith. I had never been taught. There are tons of people sitting in pews or going to church now and again who really are not getting fed the way I assume you get fed from this uh, pulpit. I mean, there are places where you can go and you hear great teaching, but don't assume that people are getting that. There are many, many, many people who go faithfully to churches and they're just not getting, you know, they're getting a 10 minute little homily or they're getting something, but they're not getting the guts of it. And by the time I went to college, uh, I had the fortune and misfortune to go to Yale University, which maybe some of you know is every, just a slightly bit secular. I don't know if you realize that about Yale. <laughs> And I always, you know, I don't mean to kick them. They, to be perfectly fair and accurate, they've only been that way for about, I would say, 210 years now. Before that, they were solidly biblical. But um, by the time I was there, I realized I don't really know what I believe. Uh, I mean, I had some ideas. I had some drawing to God in a way, but it was in inchoate, fuzzy. Um, and I realized that I, I don't, if somebody put a gun in my head and said, do you believe Jesus rose from the dead bodily? I would say, I don't know. I mean, I had never really thought about that, and I'm sure most of the people that I grew up with in that uh, church community never really thought about that, and I'm telling you, there are people in this room who've never thought about it, and there are plenty of people in churches all over America, not so much around the world, maybe in Europe, but in, you know, when you've gotta really count the costs, when you might be killed for your faith, you tend to think about these things, because it's not really worth getting killed for something that's a goofy lie. But um, uh, any man might die for a lie, but who would die for a goofy lie? Very few people would. Do. So I had never been forced to think about this. It was just cultural Christianity. You show up, you know, you go downstairs, you have a cup of coffee, you go home, that was church. And by the time I got to college, I realized that I didn't know really and truly what I believed. And when you step into a secular atmosphere, I mean, if you have to go to a place like Yale, the key is not to go there with an open mind. That's the key, because uh, if you do, you will just imbibe the Kool-Aid of you know, secular humanist uh, political liberalism. There's no other way to think. That's sort of, that's it. Unless you're a real firebrand like William F. Buckley was. And you know, every century there's one or two. Yeah. Um, so, so I just kind of went in there and tried to figure out, okay, the motto is Lux et Veritas, you know, what's the, what's the meaning of life? My parents were, you know, uh, working, cl working class European immigrants, so the, to go to college, to get to go to an Ivy League college, and, you know, I was just very open-minded. And I took this all in, and by the time I graduated, I realized I, I have no idea 
What is the meaning of life? Why am I here? Um, and if you think about it, there are really two basic views, right? One view is that God created you, loves you, has a plan for your life, wants to be with you for eternity, for you to experience his love. He literally created you for that. If that's my wife, I'm not here. <laughs> and uh, the other point of view is that you evolved by accident out of the primordial soup. It's not even that God directed the evolution, that, that there's no God. You evolved by accident out of the primordial soup. We just happen to be here. There is no such thing as meaning. I know that hurts your head. The reason it hurts your head is because actually it's not true and you were created in the image of God who gave you a longing for meaning. But imagine if that weren't true and you'd say, okay, so there's actually no meaning. We've created this concept of meaning we created the concept of good and evil. There's no such thing as good and evil. We just evolved out of the muck. Life has no meaning. The love I feel for my family is chemicals designed by accident to perpetuate the species, I guess, right? Who can live with that idea? It's so bleak, you'd want to kill yourself. So the goal, if you go to a place like Yale, is to never think about that. And to be fair, at places like Yale and most of academia, they don't honestly dare ask these questions. Because most people say, wait a second, something's wrong with this picture. You mean that if I kill five people with a knife, that's not evil, that's not bad? I don't know, it feels not great. You're sure? They'd say, no, there's no such thing as good or evil, literally, these are social constructs, and that's the world we live in, and so it's okay for you to think of it as good and evil, but really, when we boil it down, there's no such thing. That would rankle people, most people, except undergraduates, they can believe anything, but, uh, because, you know, you don't actually have to live it, right? You go, that's very interesting. Uh, I'll have another beer, you know, like, that's about it. But when you go into the real world, and you have a child, and you fall in love, and whatever, it, you, you can't really face with intellectual honesty the bleakness of that worldview. So you never will hear that worldview unpacked, except by maybe Bertrand Russell. Uh, truly, like there's hardly anyone who will ever unpack that as I just unpacked it. Or they'll say, well, that's not true, that's not really true, you can still have meaning, you can still have blah, 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 blah. That's not true. You can't. So. You get these two options, and if in most of the culture, on most TV programs, um, most movies, whatever, they're coming from a worldview where they're fudging it. They don't dare get that bleak because they know they'd lose everybody. So they kind of fudge it, and they kind of give you, it's like, well, we're not going to talk about God, we're not gonna, but we're going we're to talk about goodness, and we're going to talk about doing good unto others, and we're going to say, and you know, if you said to them, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, hold on, where did you get, where did you get that from? You know, they'd look at you like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? Everybody knows that. You say, well, I don't, I don't know that. Why should I help other people? Like, that seems stupid. Why would I do that? Now, we all know that that's the right thing to do, and we know where it comes from, but there are plenty of people who pretend that it can just, just sort of show up and everybody knows. I mean, if you ask somebody, like, oh, you, do you think racism is wrong? Do you think hating people who are a different race than you is wrong? And everybody would say, oh, oh, of course, of course. In this day and age, they'd say, oh, of course. You know, a couple centuries ago, they'd say, what? Like, of course not. But today, everybody says, of course. Well, then you say to them, okay, tell me why. Like, why is racism wrong? You never hear that question. Like, why is it wrong? What if I just say, no, I, I like it. I want to be racist. What, tell me why it's wrong. They would look at you like, how dare you even ask the question? But I'm asking the question, why is it wrong? I know why it's wrong, but you who tell me that it's wrong, you tell me why you think it's wrong. I know it's wrong because God created every human being in his sacred image. We are immortal beings with infinite value, and to treat someone else as anything less than that is profoundly wrong. Now you tell me why you think it's wrong. And again, people just, they're not, they, they're not going to think about that because that would force them into some kind of weird moral position that would make them feel awkward. 
And so we live in a culture that doesn't really drill down and look at these things because it's too scary. But think about how ridiculous that is. If there's one thing we know in our culture today is that, that racism is wrong, but go ask people, tell me why it's wrong, and they'll just look at you like you've got two heads, like you're, you're asking me why it's wrong, which everybody knows it's wrong. But everybody hasn't always known it's wrong. From the beginning of time, it's been considered right. Suddenly, it's wrong. Tell me now why we know that it's wrong. Well, part of the answer is because of people like William Wilberforce, who were fanatical, born-again, evangelical Christians, who said it was wrong because the Bible said we're supposed to love our enemies, we're supposed to love our neighbors, we're supposed to treat other people with dignity and love, and we can't do that. That's from the Bible. Most of the people in Wilberforce's world didn't know that. They just said, well, we've always had racism and slavery and, you know, what, do you, what, what? what are you going to do? That's kind of the way it is. It's the way it's been since the beginning of time. Like white people didn't invent slavery 400 years ago. We've had it since the beginning of time. Blacks enslaved blacks. Native Americans enslaved Native Americans. People get power. They want more power. They oppress people without power. That's what human beings do. Now, we know why that is because human beings are sinners. That's what we do apart from God. But if you ask God's opinion, he comes in and says, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And if you want to be right with me, you can't do that. So we live in a culture that will, will, will give lip service to all these things and sort of pretend like they just kind of bubbled up out of the goodness of our American hearts. But the fact of the matter is that we have as much original sin in America uh, as they have anywhere else in the world. Except maybe France, I'm just going to say. I'm gonna, I'll throw it out there. <laughs> I throw it out there because I'm not sure, and I want to be intellectually honest with you. I, you can talk to me later. I, but the point is that these ideas come from some place. Basically, it's the Bible, okay? And anybody tells you all religions say the same thing, whatever, that's really intellectually sloppy. That's nonsense, ladies and gentlemen. That is, it doesn't mean that there aren't good people all over the world, good people who believe all kinds of different things. We're not talking about that. We're talking about what does... What does Christianity teach? What does the Bible teach? And what do other religions teach? If, if you say it's the same thing, it only proves you have not studied religion. It, that's all it proves. Or you're being intellectually dishonest. So, as I say, I graduated Yale really having no idea what's the meaning of life and, and realizing that, you know, I always joke around that the goal is to get a really good job and to distract yourself by working really hard for a few decades and then it'll all be over, right? And on the weekend, there's like alcohol and sports, and you, you'll be fine. Just don't think about it for, you know, 70, 80, 90 years. You'll be good. But uh, I wanted to be an English. I was an English major. I wanted to be a writer, so I did not get a good job. And I had plenty of time to think about this, and unfortunately, that's what happened. I thought about it. And so I was just floundering around, and if you flounder and drift, you, I think you know what happens. You end up moving back in with your parents, right? I think I said that earlier today. That's just a, it's like a mathematical axiom. So I moved back in with my parents, and if your parents happen to be European immigrants who worked really hard to put you through a place like Yale, you really don't want to move back home. <laughs> uh, because they're not, gonna, they're not gonna be like, oh, Eric's finding himself, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> they're gonna be like, Eric, why don't you find yourself a job? Get out. Uh, so I had a really hard year. I was 24, I moved back with my parents. I, I was just lost. I wanted to be a writer. What's the meaning of life? I mean, I was truly lost. But by God's grace, I knew I was lost. And in my agony, I met a guy who was a Christian. He starts sharing his faith with me. And I knew enough to avoid those crazy Christians. I knew that. I had learned that at Yale. It's like, avoid those people because they're crazy. So I did. I avoided him, but I was in enough pain that I kind of every now and again would continue the conversation. You know what I mean? And um, I, uh, I had a job uh, making like, I don't know, $9 an hour as a proofreader at Union Carbide in Danbury, Connecticut. That's a chemical conglomerate. Uh, and the Hebrew word, if anybody knows Hebrew here, but the, the description would be Gehenna. Are you familiar with that term? <laughs> some, people, some people get that. Whisper to your neighbor uh, if they didn't get that. So I'm... I was in agony, folks. I mean, I was the editor of the humor magazine at Yale. I wrote poetry. I wanted to do all these great things with my life, write novels like John Updike and John Cheever and Faulkner. And I was in a cubicle a quarter of a mile from the nearest window proofreading 
texts of chemicals and things. It was, it was horrifying. And in that misery, God sent a man to kind of share his faith with me. And for months, I kind of, you know, like would have these sort of conversations and then avoid him. And, you know, because I, I just knew those people are crazy and divisive monsters. So, and by the way, my apologies to all of you. So, so I, uh, about a year into this, uh, long story short, I had a dream. My friend had said to me, why don't you pray that God would reveal himself to you? And I remember thinking, what does that even mean? Like, I, I, if I don't believe God exists, who would I be praying to? It's tricky. And, but if you're, if you're in enough pain every now and again, you'll just put aside those logical objections and just say, God, if you're there, give me a sign. Every now and again, I would just, I needed a sign because I didn't think you could logically get to faith, which is basically true. And I mean, there's, it's not that it's irrational, it's just that you can't get all the way there simply by, by reason. Something has to happen. At least for me, I should say, I needed something supernatural to happen. Um, and it, in my case, it involved a unicorn named Blinky. I don't know if I told you that. In the, did, I, did I mention that earlier today? Don't, make, don't laugh at Blinky. Um, no, I, uh, I had a dream. I will not share the story of that dream, but if you go to my website, it's just my name, ericmetaxas.com, or the radio website is metaxastalk.com. Now, by the way, the radio program is on the radio all over the country, but if you want to find the station or if you want to listen online, you can go to metaxastalk.com. But the video, it's a short video, and it is an absolutely amazing story, which I won't share because we don't have time, but it was like, a, it's a miracle story. God blew my mind forever. And I woke up and I knew, oh my goodness, not only is it real, but now I know that it's real. Even if I don't want to know, I now know that this is true. And I just was sure you couldn't know, and yet here I was sure that I knew. And so I gave my career over to God, which was a smart thing to do because I had not been handling it that well. I don't know if you've been tracking. And I said, God, whatever you want to do with me, whatever you want to, and long story short, he just gave me a job writing children's books and children's videos for a company called Rabbit Ears. Even that was miraculous. I've experienced a number of, I could only call them miracles where God has guided me. Now, it doesn't happen to everybody that way, but it did happen in my case. And um, I wanted to share my faith because I realized we live in a culture that has bought into the, this narrative of secular humanism, we don't really take seriously the idea that, you know, the Bible is true, that God created a people to bring forth his Messiah who would die on a cross and then be raised bodily from the dead. And, you know, that, that nobody really takes that very seriously anymore. Or if they do, they're, they're quiet about it. It's, we live in a, in a fairly secular culture. And so I guess I, I really, once this hit me that this is real, that this is true, I thought, I've, I've got to tell the world, right? I mean, this is, this is extraordinary. I never thought you could know this. Now I believe that I know it. It's changed my life. I have joy. I, it was just extraordinary. And, and I realized that, again, we live in a culture where it's hard to communicate this kind of thing. So I just wanted to, you know, write about it and talk about it. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but God took me on this career path. I ended up working for Chuck Colson. Some of you know Chuck Colson became a, uh, he was a hero of mine reading his books, and I got to work with him. I got to work for Veggie Tales. I don't know if, if you knew that I was one of the writers for Veggie Tales, which is like my greatest accomplishment. I realized that. And um, I even got to do the voice, uh, I'm the voice of the narrator on the Esther video. If you, if you watch the, is, it, is that bad? What happened? Um, no, I'm the voice, and if you listen to the Esther video, my voice, I'm the narrator on there. And I did such a great job that to this day, I am still the narrator on that video. And also, um, I wrote the uh, Hamlet omelet parody. There's, there's a, on Lila Conley Viking, the Gilbert and Sullivan one, I, I wrote the Hamlet omelet parody. And so I did some writing for them and stuff. So God took me on this strange career. I never wanted to write biographies. Um, I finally wrote a book called Everything You Always Wanted to Know About God But Were Afraid to Ask, right? Some of the older people here will remember there was a book a uh, controversial, very popular book, you know, around 1970 called Everything You Always Want to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask. Sex was the taboo subject at one time in our history. Now, God is the taboo subject, right? So I wrote this book using some Q&A, kind of fun, whatever, and I got on CNN to talk about it, which, if that's not a miracle, there's no such thing as a miracle. I was on C... Did I mention CNN? Yeah. Have you noticed they don't have a lot of Christian apologists on the show? 
on the shows there. Check it out, you'll see that's true. Um, so I'm on there and the woman asked me something, instead of asking me about all the difficult questions that I have in my book, I mean, it was, it's a very popular level book, but she asked me, what is this about uh, William Wilberforce? You have something in here about this history, or whatever, so yeah, I'm on, on national live TV and I said, oh, uh, okay, yeah, Wilberforce, I mentioned him as somebody who took the Bible seriously and because he took the Bible seriously, he changed the world, you know? So I talked a little bit about how he abolished the slave trade in the British Empire. And that's that. Well, next thing I know, somebody approaches me, how would you like to write a biography of William Wilberforce? And I thought a biography, I never really wanted to write a biography. I'm far too self-centered to spend that much time thinking about someone else <laughs> for like a long, long period of time. Um, but, you know, it offered eight bucks an hour and I was, uh, <laughs> so I, um, I found myself, I mean, I actually prayed and I felt the Lord communicate with me. Uh, as I say, that's not something that happens to me every day, but it was just one of these moments. And so I said, okay. So I wrote the book and uh, the story of Wilberforce, it's part of what I want to tell you this evening. Uh, and uh, I will in just a moment, but I, I studied the life of this man who led the battle for the abolition of the slave trade in the British Empire because of his faith in Jesus Christ. He stood up for the Africans because of his faith in Jesus, he led that battle. Amazing story. So I wrote that book. The movie came out, Amazing Grace, which was sort of synced up with my book. A lot of people think my book was the basis for the movie. That's not the case. But they came out together, and uh, I went everywhere talking about Wilberforce. And people would say, great, Eric, now you figured out what you want to do. Who are you going to write about next? And I thought, well, I really wasn't planning on writing more biographies. I thought I'd, you know, I'd do one. But people kept bugging me. And then I remembered... Uh, the summer I came to faith, when my friend at Union Carbide shared his faith with me, he gave me a copy of Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship. And he said to me, have you ever heard of Bonhoeffer? And of course, since I went to Yale, I said, no, I've never heard <laughs> of Bonhoeffer. Uh, we don't talk about that in the Ivy League. And um, he said, well, Bonhoeffer was a, a German pastor who, because of his faith in Jesus, spoke out against the Nazis, spoke up for the Jews, and was killed by the Nazis uh, in 1945, three weeks before the end of the war. He went to America twice. Uh, the second time uh, he went, it was 1939, and he really felt God calling him to go back uh, to Germany. I thought, that's a chilling story, an amazing story. It just moved me. And it moved me because, as I said, my mother's German. She grew up in Germany uh, during that time. My grandfather was killed in that war. He was a genuinely reluctant German soldier. And so I felt like Bonhoeffer was speaking up for people like my grandfather and for so many Germans who were not on board, just in case you think everybody was on board. But they were powerless people. They would be killed or sent to a concentration camp. And so when I heard this story, I, I was really moved by it. And then all these years later, I thought, perhaps I should write a book about Bonhoeffer. And I did. Um, it was a very difficult thing for me to do. I won't go into that. I tell that story in my Miracles book, but it was a trial of my life for, for uh, a number of reasons. But I knew God had his hand on the book. I don't say that lightly. There's a reason that I say that, uh, which I, I, I tell in the Miracles book. But the, the point is, it was very difficult, and I was praying and praying and praying. The book came out, and stunningly, it did well. And I say stunningly because I, of all people, was not expecting it to do well. A 600-page book on a German theologian, that's not the kind of thing you expect to sell like hotcakes. And, um, but it did sell, and as a result of writing, I mean, by now it has sold, I think, a million copies, which uh, in the base 10 number system is very impressive for a 600-page book on a German theologian. Thank you. And... Uh, it's been translated into 20 languages. Now, you have to understand, I did not expect that to happen. I just wanted to get the book done and move on with my life. I promise you, like I was not expecting it to do well. As a result of this book and the miracle of it coming into the culture, I got to meet two US presidents, um, uh, Franklin Pierce and Harry Truman. <laughs> That's not, you're still, okay, you're paying attention, good. Uh, no, I got to meet uh, George W. Bush and President Obama. I spent an hour in uh, George W. Bush's office in Dallas discussing the book with him. And, you know, for, for a really stupid guy, he's pretty smart. Um, to read a 600-page book on a German theologian and understand, it's really funny. And he is very funny. It was amazing talking to him. And I got to speak at the National Prayer Breakfast where Obama was there. I gave him a copy of the book. And, you know, 
And when all this happened, you have to understand, I am the one saying, somebody pinch me, I don't believe this. This is astounding, because it's been a terrible struggle trying to be a writer. And, but God blessed those two stories, those books, I believe in retrospect, not while I was writing them, I just had no clue, but in retrospect, because these are two stories that he wants to speak to his church in America today. Again, when I was writing them, that was not what I was thinking about. I was thinking about, I'm a writer, this is a wonderful story, I'm gonna write a book about it and get it out there. But in retrospect, it seems clear to me that these are two stories that speak powerfully to the church today. The first one is a powerful encouragement. That's the story of Wilberforce. Wilberforce faced whatever we face in our culture. If you think things are bad in our culture, they are bad, very bad. But in Wilberforce's day, things were equally or worse bad. Uh, that doesn't make sense. Equally bad or worse. Um, and to give you an example, okay, because when you think of 1780s England, you don't think of a culture that's really pagan and broken. Maybe if you're an historian or you read widely, you understand, but I didn't, I was stunned. I thought, you know, harpsichord, minuets, powdered wigs, what could be the problem? But uh, it turns out they had this terrible thing called slavery and the slave trade. Now, you don't think a culture that had a slave trade, which, by the way, in, the, in my book, Amazing Grace, where I write about this, I give a first-person account of what the Middle Passage was. If you're African-American, you probably know about this. It is one of the most horrific things I have ever read. And when you read that, you understand human beings can be evil, really evil for money, really evil. And it's so disturbing. And Wilberforce lived in a culture that said, hey, you know what, that's, that we just, that's what we have. That's the way it is. It's not perfect, but what are you gonna do? Well, um, honestly, when I wrote the book, I didn't understand how broken that culture was because you don't think that they only had the slave trade and slavery and everything else was hunky-dory. Uh, it wasn't. It was a basically pagan culture, okay? They were Christian in name only, right? I mean, you, you've seen that before in action. It's possible to be Christian in name only and to be a total hypocrite. And I'm not gonna look you in the eye, you know who you are. So, so the point is, here you have a culture that is Christian in name only. The Church of England is the official church of the land. But in the 18th century, they had pretty much retreated from the gospel, okay? Uh, the previous century had, had, been, had seen a lot of religious wars, and so they kind of retreated into what we can call French Enlightenment rationalism, which is nothing, right? You know, being a nice person, tolerate other points of view, who's to say what's good or bad, you know, enjoy yourself. That's kind of French Enlightenment rationalism in a nutshell. Now, if you've actually studied French Enlightenment uh, rationalism, I know you're on the verge of walking out the room. Please don't. But I'm just going to tell you that it was nothing close to the gospel of Jesus Christ from the Bible. Nothing like it. It's talking about, you know, a vague clock, clockmaker deity. Uh, it, it, it's not challenging. It's nothing from the Bible. It's not about Jesus. All of that stuff was embarrassing and off-putting and part of the past. They had you know, evolved to be enlightened. It was the Enlightenment era. And so for a hundred years, the, go the gospel was not preached and the Bible was not taught in England. And let me tell you something. When that happens, the poor suffer the most because it is from the gospel you get the crazy idea that people who have should help those who don't have, okay? In this country, that idea has so latched on that we argue about how to do it. We argue viciously about how to do it, right? The lefties say the government should do it, the righties say the private sector should do it, and we're at each other's throats over how to help the poor. That's good, right? We argue about how. In those days, they didn't argue about how, they just felt there is no reason to help the poor. People are poor because they deserve to be poor. You can call it bad karma. You can call it whatever. Uh, I'm blessed because God has decided to bless me. I must be wonderful. And you're in the gutter and drunk and have no teeth because you're cursed and that's your issue. And to help you would be to sort of, you know, kind of mess with God's plan, right? That's kind of the Eastern karmic view of, of the world, right? What's my motivation to help you in the gutter? I'm up here because I deserve to be up here, and you're in the gutter because you deserve to be in the gutter, 
right? And uh, if, you, if you don't uh, watch it, you know, you may come back as a cockroach. So what's the motivation? Well, that was Great Britain before Wilberforce. If you talk to the wealthy, they didn't even have any idea of what we take for granted, that, oh, I should give back. The idea of give back did not exist. I'm not going to unpack this further, but I'm telling you, things were horrible. So you have the slave trade, which is an abomination. Just read that passage in my book, and you will see, ladies and gentlemen, it's horrifying. Now, they didn't have slavery really in England. It was all down in the, in the West Indies and the colonies. So people in Great Britain didn't see it. And you could almost say that they were ignorant of it and that you could hardly blame the average person because they had really no idea what's going on. All they know is they get, they get their sugar, the economy's doing well. They don't know what happens on those ships that go from, you know, uh, from, from Liverpool down to West Africa to pick up human beings, to bring them across to the West Indies, uh, and then to take rum, molasses, uh, sugar back to England. It wasn't in front of them the way it is it was here in America. And so Wilberforce is living in a world that is deeply broken. They've abandoned the gospel. There is slavery. There's the slave trade. But that's just the beginning. Because if you have a worldview where God is not in the picture, what's going to happen? Everything's going to happen. The poor will not be taken care of, as I just said, and they weren't. Alcoholism was rampant. The wealthy were perpetually drunk on claret, the poor were perpetually drunk on gin. I'm not exaggerating. It was epidemic. There was horrific child labor. Little children were working dangerous jobs for 12 hours a day. The, the, the penal system was monstrous. Everywhere you looked, there was brokenness. Into the situation comes William Wilberforce, Long story short, he becomes a Christian around his 26th birthday. His scales fall from his eyes, and he realizes God has put him in politics to do something about all of this, not just the slave trade. He said, he wrote in his diary in 1787, God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners, meaning the reformation of culture. In other words, the suppression of the slave trade and everything else. He understood that the, the culture was deeply broken. And I'm, I'm, just to give you one factoid, half of, uh, I'm sorry, 25% of the single women in London were prostitutes. 25%, the average age was 16. What kind of a culture are you talking about, folks? That's a sick culture. That is a broken culture. The leading figure in the land, the Prince of Wales who became George IV, Right, this is the trickle-down morality theory. George IV, he was going to be the king, the defender of the faith. He was known publicly to have slept with 7,000 women. Anybody could understand like 2,500. <laughs> but once... Thank you. You've been a great audience. Good night. <laughs> not only did he do that, here's the key, not only did he do that, Everyone knew this. In other words, here you have the leading figure in the land, the man who's going to be king. Everybody wants to be like him. He's wealthy, he's famous, he's powerful. That's the life he led. What message does that send to everyone in the culture, to all the other elites who are living similarly? Gambling and drinking and whoring, that was life in Great Britain. The poor were left to rot and die. Wilberforce comes into the situation he sees what's going on, and he believes God Almighty has called him not to go into the ministry, but to stay in politics, because that was God's calling on his life. And John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, encouraged him there and said, who knows but God, that God has put you where you are. You have the skills, you have an incredible ability as an orator and a debater, which one needed as a parliamentarian in those days. So Wilberforce decides, God has called me to this task. And the good news, the encouragement of this story is that by God's amazing grace, William Wilberforce was the leader in a movement that genuinely changed the world. Number one, he battled against the slave trade. That story is told in the movie Amazing Grace, which was a huge Herculean effort because nobody thought 
that it was even possible to talk about abolishing the slave trade. It was an insanity. He knew it was wrong, and he knew God was behind him, and he fought, and he fought, and he fought, and 18 years after bitter battle, after bitter battle, after bitter battle, he finally succeeded in 1807. And for that alone, he ought to be one of the most famous people in the world. Uh, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass hailed him as the pioneer of the movement. Imagine in the 1780s thinking about this, right? And in 1807, that was done. But he applied himself to everything else that was broken in the culture. When you bring the gospel to bear on a broken culture, it's kind of like looking for business opportunities in Russia in 1991, right? There's like nothing but business opportunities. There has been no business here. This is like, this is, this is it. Everywhere Wilberforce looked, he saw brokenness. So he began deputizing people, friends, to, you know, to take on this and to take on that. At one point, he presided over 69, or I should say his name was uh, uh, on the list as a member or a leader of 69 small societies dedicated to you know, help indigent women and to help this group and that group. And what. Stunning, stunning, stunning. He was probably the most successful social reformer in the history of the world because of his faith in Jesus Christ. Now, he surrounded himself with friends. He would say, he'd be the first one to say he didn't do enough. He'd be the first one to say he did nothing, that it was his friends that encouraged him. And, that, you know, he encouraged his friends, and they all did it together, the Clapham Circle. He made Christianity popular in a way by being a leading figure who was outspoken about his faith, but not a dour religious figure. He was very moral, but he was also somebody that people were attracted to him. They didn't see a, a, a dour uh, moralistic judge. There was something winsome about him. He seemed to actually believe that he was a sinner. He seemed to actually believe that he was a recipient of the grace of God. And if you really believe that, it's hard for you to be nasty to other people because they're failing uh, morally, right? That's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. So Wilberforce, over the course of a few decades, utterly changed the picture in the British Empire, which really was just the beginning, because you know the British Empire was around the whole world, so it affected the entire West, and it especially affected the United States of America. This idea of people having money or whatever that they should use it to do something for the poor, whatever became popular, he made goodness fashionable, just as it is today, right? If you go to New York City where I live, to Manhattan where I live, Every good atheist with money knows I'm supposed to give back. I, they can't really tell you why anymore. They can tell you like why racism is wrong. They just know they have to give back, that they've got to help the poor. And why is that again? I, I don't know. How can you even ask that question? It's obvious, right? Well, it comes from the gospel. And Wilberforce was really the first man in history to take these ideas from the gospel and to haul them into mainstream culture. That's an historical fact. I may be overstating it a little bit, but not much. He made these ideas popular, so popular that in the West today, everybody understands this idea of having a social conscience, of helping the poor. Again, we argue about how. Private sector, public sector, but nobody argues whether. We all know that somehow we're responsible. Where did that idea come from? Wilberforce got it from the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he hauled it by the grace of God into the mainstream of culture at a time when it was possible to do that, and it has caught on and been with us ever since. And by the time Wilberforce died in 1833, not only the slave trade was abolished, slavery itself was abolished in Parliament three days before Wilberforce died. That's not in the movie, but it's like something out of a movie, right? On his deathbed, in his last 24 hours of consciousness, this young member of Parliament comes to tell him Parliament has abolished slavery, not the slave trade. That had been abolished in 1807. 1833, slavery has been abolished, and we as a nation are going to stand and use the money in the treasury to make this right and to end slavery in the British Empire, the entire empire, and we're going to enforce it. That, of course, uh, and what he did in 1807, had a huge effect on all the countries of Europe who followed suit, and we eventually followed suit. But everything else changed as well. The Victorian era, which began officially in 1839, a few years after he died, what is that era known for? Morality. So much so that we laugh about it. 
that's because of the story of a man used by God named William Wilberforce, which tells you at least one thing. Number one, it tells you it's possible. Number two, it tells you that one human being has power to do things that you'll never dream. You, you, you don't know, you can think of it as the butterfly effect. Not each of us is gonna be a member of parliament or something, but the point is it doesn't matter. When you see one human being utterly give himself over to God's purposes in his life, what he does has infinite repercussions. And he truly changed the world. I mean, Great Britain in the 19th century was infinitely different than it was uh, when he took power. So that story is a true story, and we all ought to find it deeply encouraging. If you think things are bad, it's like you're not supposed to worry about that things are bad. You're supposed to just do what God calls you to do. And you're supposed to know, as Wilberforce knew, it is not your battle, it is God's battle. If God has called you to the battle, he will do it. Your job is to be obedient to him and try to hear his voice and try to do what he calls you to do. Pray with your friends. That's one of the most encouraging stories there is. So I say that as an encouragement to you. Whatever is wrong, trust me, uh, you know, G.K. Chesterton was asked, what's wrong with the world? And he said, I am, right? Think of it that way. You are what's wrong with the world to the extent that you're not giving everything you have to God's purposes in your life. Now, that's going to be different for everybody, you know? Not everybody's going to go into prison ministry. Not everybody's called to give all the money they have. Not Everybody's called to do different things. God created you for that. It's not some horrible thing. God created you, literally created you for that He's blessed you to be a blessing, and it's never too late to start. People say, well, I don't know, I'm pretty old or whatever. You don't understand, in God's economy, it could, do, it could be something in the last week of your life or in the last year of your life. If you give God everything now, it can affect eternity, which is infinite. So don't be pragmatic about it. Understand that this is literally why God created you. And there are no exceptions to this. This is why he created us and this is why he has given us what he's given us. Whatever talent, whatever money, whatever power, whatever influence, God has given it to you for his purposes. That's Genesis 12. You're blessed to be a blessing. That's, that's what you were made for. You cannot have the joy you're meant to have unless you do that. And don't think of it as some horrible thing. It's precisely the opposite. It's the very reason you're called onto this planet, into this world. So that's the encouraging story, but there's a warning. The Bonhoeffer story is a warning. Bonhoeffer, as many of you know, uh, was a German pastor who got involved in the plot to kill Hitler. What he really was doing once the Nazis took over is his faith, which was a deep faith, was quite different from the faith of most Christians in Germany at the time. Some of them were hypocrites. Some of them were just going along as we do. Will, uh, Bonhoeffer was like a prophet. God spoke to him, and I don't mean in a mystical way, but he knew that he had to wake up the church to stand against the evil of Nazism. Now you say, how does it that he know that, knew that and all these other pastors didn't know that? Well, there were, there were other pastors that saw this, but he really saw it clearly and was a leader, tremendously talented leader. And like the prophets of old, the prophets of the Old Testament, what happens to the prophets? You know, like thousands of years later, we say, that guy was awesome. But at the time, we killed him. Uh, we tend not to want to hear what the prophets have to say, right? They're just a bummer, you know, they're just a bummer. And he was one of those bummers, you know, the wire rimmed glasses, very intellectual, saying these negative things, like, please, please, you know, I've had a hard day. Well, Bonhoeffer tried with all his might and main to wake up the Church of Jesus Christ in Germany to say to them, if you will stand now, together, we can defeat the Nazis. Now, the church was incredibly powerful, and I'm telling you from history, if you've read the book, you know, uh, the church had the ability to do something about this. If they stood up in time, if they stood up together and linked arms together, but if they hesitated, there was a window of opportunity. I think of it as the Gulliver being tied down by the Lilliputians I think I used this, uh, this image earlier today. Uh, I, I think, you know, the little fusions are tiny and they're tying down Gulliver who's powerful. And if he wakes up, he can just rise up and pull these stakes out of the ground and crush them. But if he keeps sleeping, there comes a time at which there are enough cords so that when he decides to get up, he can't. That's the story of the German church. 
Bonhoeffer knew that if he can wake up the church in time to see the evil and to stand against it, which takes courage, okay? This is an issue of religious liberty which we're facing in our generation, different but similar. When the state begins to bully the church, the church has to wake up, understand what the role of the church is. The role of the church is not to be pals with the state. The role of the church is to be the conscience of the state. And God has always had his prophets in the Old Testament and later to speak to the people of God, to exhort them to be the people of God, right? And how many times did that work uh, in the Old Testament? I don't think so many times. Uh, they're exhorted to be the people of God, but they don't listen, they don't listen, they have to listen, they, they have to hear it the hard way. The stiff-necked Jews, right? Well, Christians have been grafted into the stiff-necked tree, and so we are precisely the same stiff-necked in the sense that when we are told exactly what is going on, we say, well, I don't know, I think you're being a little severe. That's what happened with Bonhoeffer. He said to the German church, listen, we've got to get political yesterday, okay? And they said, wait, well, hey, Romans 13, we shouldn't be political. Uh, I don't know, it's not our job to be political, it's our job to preach the gospel. Jews are being murdered day by day by day. Well, I don't want to get involved in politics. I don't want to lie. I don't want to, I don't want to do anything sinful. You know, I want to just be a pious, good person and get into heaven. And the Jews can rot in hell. Right? Isn't, isn't that where it goes, right? In other words, if the Gestapo knocks on your door and says, are you hiding any Jews here? And you say, oh, I don't want to lie. Uh, yeah, there's, there's some Jews in the basement. Go kill them now. You know, go, go kill them now. And I'm justified before God. Who could believe that God would be behind that, right? When you think it through, that is piousness and religiosity masquerading as doing God's will. But it, it's, it's a demonic lie. It's the opposite, right? Bonhoeffer was speaking to the church and saying, you're being religious. You're being religious. You're being pharisaical. You're not fooling God. God has called on you to stand in this hour to do what is right. He gave you life. And you are to use it for his purposes. But everybody had their excuses. There were people who really thought we shouldn't get, the church should never get political. You know, if, if Africans are rotting in a slave ship, I think maybe being politically involved to do something about that might be God's will. But there are people to this day who think that the gospel, I, should, I shouldn't get political, that's dirty. Yeah, it is dirty. And it's God's will for you to do something to help those who are suffering. That's the way it's always been, and it's always been the tendency of the church to say, not now, not for me. Well, Bonhoeffer, as we know, failed in this. He cried out and cried out and cried out, and by the time a few people saw it, Gulliver could not stand up. When the church woke up, it was game over. There was nothing they could do. They had been, the Nazis had become so powerful, there was nothing they could do. So that's the warning for us folks, is that in America today, I really believe the church has been asleep uh, and, you know, this is like a cliche, but let's be specific. Uh, on the issue of religious liberty, for example, okay, our whole country, my, my new book on America is based on this, uh, I write about this, but our whole country is founded on this idea of freedom, which most of us in this room didn't even learn in school. This is like since the 60s, this has not been taught very much. But what generations and generations knew and what the founders took for granted was this idea that liberty is at the heart of everything. It means self-government. How do you govern yourself? By being virtuous, right? By being virtuous. Faith has always played a central role in true self-government and in the freedom, the ordered freedom bequeathed to us by the founders, really by God, right? But somehow that has gotten lost. And somehow we have a kind of secular worldview in the culture, which the government is now participating in and taking sides in. The government is never supposed to do that. that. The government did that in Germany, okay? The Hitler government tried to bully the church because they genuinely felt, we don't have separation of church and state here. The church and the state have always been, you know, so Hitler felt I've got a role over the church. And there are many countries today, Putin and the Russian uh, Orthodox uh, bishops, there's, there's ugly stuff going on there. All through history, you have church and state, cozy relationships. In this country, we had this idea of the separation of church and state to protect the church 
from being bullied by a powerful state. We've lost that, and so in the last few years, on a number of issues, the church is not even aware of this. I know there are people here who aren't aware of the HHS mandate, right? But when the government says, you must pay into Obamacare uh, to subsidize abortifacient drugs that are gonna uh, you know, take the life, a life in the womb, there are plenty of Americans that say, I can't do that, that's against my conscience, I believe that's wrong. The government says, tough luck, eat it, you will do that. This is the United States of America. The government can't tell people to violate their consciences. That's like against everything we believe in. But suddenly, the government has adopted a worldview concerning sexuality and some things which is a little bit more important than your conscience on that issue. That's what's called the establishment of a religion. I mean, it's not Methodism or Congregationalism or Catholicism, but the point is once the government says, we're gonna go with this way of seeing ultimate things, sexuality and so on and so forth, and you've got your views, but this one is gonna win. We pick this one, and if you violate this one, if you don't do what we say, this, the force of the state's gonna come against you, right? The same thing with, you know, let's say you're a, a photographer, right? And you photograph weddings, and you consider it your art, and it's your life, and whatever, and somebody says, we want you to photograph our same-sex wedding, and say, ooh, I can't really do that. I'm a Christian, uh, I don't wanna offend you, but I can suggest other people who would do it, but I, I can't do that. that. That just violates what I believe in. In this day and age now, not only uh, will you um, be frowned on, but now you will be prosecuted as though you don't even have the right to say no to that. Now, these are just a couple of little examples, but the point is that we're in a new place when the government can tell the church what to do, what not to do. To, you better violate your conscience or you're going to pay a lot of fine or something like that. You have to understand it's not about right and wrong, okay? We, we can say, well, we believe that, that these things are wrong and we believe the biblical view is right. But we're not even talking about that. We're talking about freedom. We're talking about if you have a view which the government doesn't like, you're free to have that view. You don't, no one can force you to photograph a same-sex wedding if you don't want to. Right? I mean, you could, you, you could even go farther, right? You could even say that nobody afford, should be able to force you to do anything. It's, you know, you, you, you ought to be able to follow your conscience. And so now we know this has limits, okay? We're not talking about lunch counters in the 60s here. But those are the limits. But the point is that we've come to this place where the state is now saying to the church, you will do this and you will do that. And I'm here to tell you, if the church does not stand up, what will happen is what happened in Germany in the 30s. Now, I'm not talking about the Holocaust, I'm not talking, it doesn't really matter what I'm talking about, I'm just talking about wherever it goes, it's bad. It's for, for one reason it's bad, is it's the end of America. You cannot have the freedoms that we have if the state effectively establishes a religion and begins to bully the church. So, it falls to the church to stand up and be the church. Now, I believe that, uh, God called me to write the, the Bonhoeffer book really in retrospect because of these kinds of issues because it's a perfect illustration for us to say this is what will happen. It doesn't have to happen. The Germans had no clue. There was no Bonhoeffer before Bonhoeffer so they could say oh we better be careful. They had no idea. They didn't know about the separation of church and state. They didn't have the tradition that we do. But if we do not understand that the church has to be the church and has to stand up whatever that means, we will wake up when it's too late. And, and I would say this, I would say that America is a, is a country that has blessed the whole world. And when we have thrived, when we've been wealthy, we have been able to bless those who don't have. In this country and in other countries, we've, we've been able to export our ideas of freedom to other countries. We've really been able to be a blessing. It doesn't mean we're perfect but we've been able to be a great blessing. If that ends, if America ceases to be America, which we're on the verge of doing, I don't mean to sound histrionic, unfortunately, um, I think it's simply the case, uh, we have to rise to the occasion. We, meaning the church, has to rise to the occasion and has to stand. Now, this is gonna mean something different for everybody. What it ultimately means is, if you think of yourself as a Christian, you've gotta know what you believe. Bonhoeffer knew what he believed. 
He acted on it. He wasn't afraid to die. He lived his faith. He died his faith. That's the only way to live. If you're not sure what you believe, you need to, to figure it out. You need to think through, is this stuff true? Or is it just some crazy thing that I kind of picked up from my family and I don't really know what I believe? I believe the church needs to be all in. I said earlier that this is literally why we were created by God, to be all in. If you want to experience joy, you live that kind of life. You talk to people who are living that kind of life. It's not that they don't have trouble, but to have that life of meaning, that's God's gift to us. That's what he wants for us. So I'm here to say and to conclude by saying, don't live your faith in half measures. Know what you believe. Uh, in, it's kind of funny, in writing my miracles book, I convinced myself that I myself w was hardly believing what is true. In other words, when you really look at it, you go, holy cow, this is really, really, really true. If I know that, you cannot stop me from living out my faith. You cannot stop me from wanting to share my faith with people because it's the most wonderful thing there is. If I forgot that it's the most wonderful thing there is, I need to remind myself because actually it is the most wonderful thing there is. Actually, it is. When you sing songs like we just sang, you can kind of feel it. But we need to also know it intellectually. We need to live it out. That's why we're on the planet. So the story of Wilberforce, as I say, is a profound encouragement. If you're laboring in the, in the life movement, let me tell you, don't lose heart. What is right is right. Be loving to those on the other side of that issue. But the truth will out. God will honor you as you honor him. Uh, whether you're fighting in the issue of religious liberty, whether you're involved in politics, the point is God calls every single person to live his or her life out differently. It makes no difference. God knows why he made you, what he gave you. All he needs from you is the assent, say, yes, Lord, use me. I do believe we're at a time in the culture where the church really has to wake up now. Not 10 years from now, not even five years from now. I'm not going to unpack this further. I'm just going to tell you that uh, we're either all in for Jesus or, or make sure you know that the whole idea of the Bible is a joke and a sham and go on with your life. But if you suspect it's true, make sure you know how true it is and how wonderful it is and how amazing it is uh, because that will give you the strength to live it out. And as you live it out, you will be blessed, others will be blessed, and when you go into the presence of your Father in heaven, you won't have any regrets. Wouldn't that be terrible to get there and to realize, oh, I wish I had tried a little harder. I don't, do I get a second chance? No, you don't get a second chance. This is it, folks. We've all crossed the starting line. This is it. Imagine, this is it, and we have the privilege of being all in for the Lord of the universe who loves us so much that if we got a glimpse of it, we would die. That's how powerful it is. We can't, we can't, can't even look at it apart from Jesus. That's true. And so I just want to say to you tonight, uh, because these things are true, because these things are gloriously true, don't miss the opportunity to spend every calorie of energy you have, every penny you have, every second you have, every connection you have, to do God's will with joy and love. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.